On this edition of the CBS Video Library of World War II, we will focus on the role of U.S. air and sea power in the Pacific Campaign. We'll see dramatic footage of the great sea and air battle that took place at Midway. We'll examine the strategy and see the action behind the taking of Tarawa, the Marianas, Iwo Jima. We'll fly in a B-29 Super Fortress on a bombing mission against Japan. Our first chapter in this historic compilation begins with the story of Japanese success. We go back to the year 1941. The month was December. The date, as President Roosevelt said later, was one that would live in infamy. In 1941, naval strategists measure the strength of a navy by counting its battleships. The battleship strength of the United States Pacific Fleet is destroyed at Pearl Harbor. Almost unnoticed at the time, none of the burning ships is an aircraft carrier. The American aircraft carriers are on the high seas between Pearl Harbor and Midway. Eight forty hours, December 7th. Message from Hawaii radio to Guam, Midway, Wake, to the Philippines. This is not an exercise. Japan has attacked Pearl Harbor. The Japanese plan of attack calls for simultaneous strikes at Pearl Harbor and the Philippines. Bad weather delays the Philippine strike for nine hours. The Japanese expect they will have to fight their way into Clark Field, the main Air Force base in the Pacific. The American commanders in the Philippines have been unable to decide on a course of action. The American bombers are on the ground as the Japanese come in. Clark Field lies open, vulnerable. After the Pearl Harbor warning, American air power in the Pacific is destroyed on the ground. Now the Japanese perimeter explodes through the Pacific. Without anything but token resistance from the remnants of Allied air power and sea power, the enemy seizes control of the South China Sea, the Sea of Java, and the seas of the East Indies. The Japanese army plunges into Southeast Asia. One after another, supposedly impregnable Allied fortresses fall to the enemy. The British army surrenders at Singapore. With the fall of Singapore, the Japanese achieve domination of Southeast Asia. Only one battle moves slowly, the battle against the American army in the Philippines.
On Bataan, the Japanese pressure is relentless. The Japanese take Manila in January of 1942. enemy takes Bataan and aims at the last refuge of the Americans, Corregidor, an island in the Bay of Manila. Corregidor is invaded. May 6, 1942, the final surrender of the American army in the Philippines. The defeated Americans began a death march to prison camps. The Japanese Empire has won the war it set out to fight. The Japanese perimeter covers 20 million square miles of the Earth. The Japanese military estimated one year to conquer the South Pacific. It has taken only six months. A small clique points out that Japan has won everything for which she went to war. It is suggested that Japan offered to negotiate peace with the United States. But the Japanese Navy rules the military, and the Japanese Navy has an inflexible doctrine symbolized by the doors of the Admiral Togo Shrine. Togo, who in 1905 defeated the Russians in one classic naval battle, has left this military axiom, destroy the enemy's fleet in one decisive battle. The commanders of the Imperial Navy argue that the United States Navy must be forced into a last decisive battle. Since the Americans have lost their battleships and since Japan may choose the point at which she will attack, this battle cannot be anything but a victory for Japan. This is the Japanese plan. The objectives are Midway and the destruction of the United States fleet. A later objective is Hawaii. The key to the Hawaiian Islands is Midway. The opening phase will be a surprise attack at Midway where the Japanese expect only light resistance. The American fleet is expected to steam toward Midway after the Japanese strike. The two fleets will engage in a classic sea battle. And since the Japanese have superiority in battleships and aircraft carriers, the American fleet will be destroyed. Naval cadets at Itajima are told, we have won the battle so far, but the enemy is not yet beaten. The opponent is still strong. We must meet them in one decisive struggle. You will be called upon. You must prepare yourself. The essence of a surprise attack is secrecy, and Japanese security has been compromised because the Japanese secret codes have been broken by the Americans. All messages sent to the Imperial Japanese fleet are falling into American hands. The successful decoding of the Japanese messages is the greatest intelligence victory of the war. Midway will be prepared.
On the basis of the intercepted messages, the United States Pacific Fleet begins to take up defensive positions near Midway. The Empire of Japan has not lost a naval battle in 300 years. The Japanese fleet will be at Midway numerically superior in all classes of ships. But their intelligence is faulty. The Japanese believe the main strength of the American fleet is still in Hawaii or in Australian waters. The Japanese believe their attack on Midway will be a complete surprise. Hidden behind a bad weather front, the Japanese fleet moves to Midway. Midway was prepared as Pearl Harbor was not. Although the Marines were outnumbered, the island was on the alert. The Air Force sends as many B-17s to Midway as the island can handle. A force of 17 heavy bombers is gathered on the island. Within a few hours after the planes arrive, they are ordered into the air to make long-range searches. Although we know the Japanese are coming, we do not know exactly where they are. Early in the morning of June 4, 1942, the decisive contact is made. Enemy carriers are reported. Enemy planes are seen inbound toward Midway. cause some damage to shore installations, but the attack does not succeed. If the Japanese are to soften up Midway, they must strike again. Midway is still secure. Admiral Nagumo knows he must launch a stronger attack against the island, but if he is to strengthen his attack force, he must use his reserves. The Japanese reserve planes are armed with torpedoes. If they are to attack Midway, bombs must be substituted for torpedoes. The Japanese admiral does not know that the American carriers are in the vicinity. He orders the change from torpedoes to bombs. While the change in weapons is being made, the Japanese carriers are vulnerable to air attack. This is the turning point of the Pacific War. Suddenly, overhead, appear the carrier-based planes of the United States Pacific Fleet. bombers penetrate the Japanese fighter screen, penetrate the Japanese anti-aircraft screen and catch the enemy carriers. Five minutes after the attack begins, two great Japanese carriers, Akagi and Soryu, lie broken in the water. 
five minutes after the attack begins, American naval aircraft assert their dominance over the surface ships. The orthodox naval doctrine of a battleship war is destroyed by air power. fleet gathers for one last effort. On the enemy carrier, here you, are the remnants of Japan's first line naval pilots. They are told, at all costs and with all sacrifice, attack the American carriers. the American planes are returning. Two American torpedo squadrons have been wiped out, and the survivors, low on gasoline, have difficulty finding their ships. The Japanese planes are only a few miles behind the Americans. As the enemy is sighted, the American planes are waved off. is gallant and persistent. The Yorktown is hit. Damage control parties fight to save the ship. Then the Japanese torpedoes come in. The United States will lose the Yorktown, but the Japanese will lose 200 of their best pilots, a blow from which the Japanese Navy will never recover.
as the attack began, it is over. The surface ships of both fleets have not exchanged one shot. Midway remains American. After midway, there is no direction the Japanese perimeter can move except to retreat toward Tokyo. Following the Battle of Midway, the Pacific War took on a pattern that was to hold sway for the entire campaign. It was island warfare, securing stepping stones toward the Japanese mainland, bases for U.S. air power. In this next report, we look at how this pattern became established. The die was cast at a place called Tarawa. November 1943. The Pacific Fleet is being ordered into its greatest offensive action to date. For three days, the big carriers lay to refueling. In safe waters, fuel oil, aviation gas, and supplies come aboard. From Hawaii and New Zealand, from San Diego, Pearl Harbor, Samoa, and Guadalcanal, the task force assembles. The whole armada covers 50 square miles of ocean. The fleet is steaming to an island of only 290 acres, Tarawa. our objective, Tarawa and its airstrip. Control of Tarawa means control of the Gilbert Islands. Control of the Gilberts means bases from which we can invade the Marshalls. Control of the Marshalls means bases from which we can invade the Marianas. Control of the Marianas means bases from which we can attack Japan herself. This is the Central Pacific pattern. The center of the pattern is the American aircraft carrier. The planes are armed and ready. The Army Air Force has already bombed Tarawa. The naval carriers will finish the job. The naval pilots are told there is the suspicion the Japanese have abandoned Tarawa. Nevertheless, the bombing and shelling will far exceed anything ever done in the past. Never in the history of warfare will so much high explosive be dropped on so small an area.
against 290 Japanese acres, we launch 200 planes. Within seven minutes, the few enemy planes on the airstrip are knocked out. The island is bombed and the returning planes report no signs of life. Nevertheless, the fire control centers call for the first of 3,000 tons of naval shells. yards from the beach. The Marines transfer to the landing craft. The run-in has been timed for high tide so that the heavier ships can sail over the coral reef. yards. The first error is apparent. The tide is moving in the wrong direction. It is low tide, not high. But there's no answering fire from the beach. The island may be abandoned. 3,000 yards. The enemy is there. yards. The Japanese are on Tarawa in great strength. One thousand yards, low tide. The landing craft run aground on the coral below the water line. There is nothing the trapped marines can do but go ashore on foot. The troops wade to the beach line against increasing small arms fire. Ten yards. Some units cannot gain the beach. beachhead is only 20 yards at its deepest point. It is already too expensive. For the first time in the history of the United States Marines, this signal is sent. Issue in doubt. If the enemy mounts a counterattack, he will push us into the sea. Second day, the second Marine Division makes its move inland.
The Navy has fired 3,000 tons of high explosive into one half a mile of island. The carrier planes have flown 1,000 sorties. It still takes the flamethrower, the machine gun, the rifle, and courage. day, Tarawa is secured. But the cost is heavy. A unit finds six men out of ten have been wounded. One out of eight lays dead on the beach. The battle for Tarawa is won. Some men talked about Tarawa in terms of tactics. Some men talked in terms of how many sorties had been flown. Some said we should have done more bombing. Others said we needed more rockets, or we could have worked closer to the infantry. The facts were, and we knew it, that a lot of Marines were dead, but not one airman had died at Tarawa. A new kind of carrier action is called for. The Japanese could not have built Tarawa into a fortress if they did not have a supply bastion deep in the Central Pacific. This supply point is the strongest Japanese position outside the home islands. If it can be neutralized, further invasions may not be so costly. The island is Truk. Truk is the Japanese Gibraltar. Truck supplies the Marshalls, the Marianas, the Carolines, New Guinea. Truck will not be invaded. Truck will be destroyed from the air.
Japanese sound detectors pick up the American planes. The Japanese fighter strength on truck equals the incoming American. The Japanese Zero is the same plane used in the attack on Pearl Harbor. The Americans are flying a new fighter, the Hellcat. Slightly less maneuverable than the Zero, the Hellcat is more rugged and can outclimb and outdive the enemy. Once the American fighters have won supremacy, the dive bombers are sent in. The fighter victory is so overwhelming that not a single enemy plane challenges the dive bombers. The only resistance comes from the enemy's anti-aircraft guns. The white balls floating up lazily are Japanese anti-aircraft bullets. The enemy ships in the lagoon are in an impossible position. If they stay in truck, they have no protection. If they try to leave the harbor, the surface forces of the United States Navy are waiting to destroy them. In one day, naval air power sinks 200,000 tons of shipping. Coming home. Some planes have been holed by flak. The formations are ragged. Some are low on gas. But most make it. He runs out of gas just short of the carrier.
plane is thrown overboard to clear the flight deck. at truck is not without cost. But after the American carrier strikes, the Japanese write off truck as a naval base. The air in the Central Pacific has been cleared of enemy opposition. power reaches to the west and to the north, toward the last islands, Japan. Before the full force of American air power could be brought to bear against the Japanese mainland, more island bases were needed more stepping stones nearer to Japan. The islands known as the Marianas, Saipan, Tinian, Guam, were next in line, and that's where our story takes us. We begin this chapter with a look at an airplane. American B-24s, outbound to Truk, Wewak, Biak, the Carolines, the Marianas. Outbound to a hundred places whose names Americans never knew before the war and have forgotten since the war. The B-24, a flying gas tank. Not wanted in the European theater of operations because it handles like a truck and cannot easily be flown in formation. The B-24, sent to the Pacific because it has the longest range of any American airplane. Over the vast Pacific, range is essential. Jack's calling out enemy fighters. Now watch it. Watch that cloud bank at 3 o'clock high. All right. Bogey coming in at 2 o'clock. Okay, right. Waste is yours. There's another one at 4. There's about seven of them at 2 o'clock. They're turning in. Coming to you, Ertl. Pick him up when he comes by. Bandit at 3, turning into 12. Watch him, Tom. Blackjack blue to blackjack black. Bring it in closer, boy. Black straight ahead. They're wide. Bosporus 100 feet low. I'm clutched in. Estimate the target 30 seconds. Bombs away. Wewak, Biak, the Carolines, the Marianas. The B-24 was not designed for this kind of bombing. It was built as a strategic weapon to bomb the enemy's home industries. But in the spring of 1944, we are 3,000 miles short of Japan. The long-range bomber is the tip of our offensive spear, the longest-reaching tactical weapon in our arsenal. The B-24 strikes at Japanese shipping, Japanese supply dumps, Japanese airfields. But not yet at Japan itself. The losses are never as high as Europe, but some planes will never return. Some men will never return. Some run short of gas and ditch in the Pacific.
Some run into trouble and try to make it into the first field they see. Wheels up, coming into a fighter base where the runway is too short for a heavy bomber. at home to airstrips bought in blood. Buna Mission, Bella La Bella, Ley, Munda, a hundred places whose names have been forgotten. Most make it home. Tropical heat, boredom, uneasiness, uncertainty. Most make it home to the bomber bases. This is the bomber line in May 1944. We hold parts of New Guinea and some of the islands in the Bismarck Sea. The bomber line threatens the Japanese positions in the Carolines. We hold the Solomons and the Gilberts. The bomber line protects our convoys to Australia. We hold bases in the Marshalls. The bomber line threatens Japanese positions in the Marianas. But there is a 3,000 mile gap between our bomber line and Japan. The logical step, the next chain of islands, the Marianas. In May of 1944, the Americans assemble an invasion fleet. A correspondent wrote, We have assembled 500 ugly ships and are loading them with a quarter of a million naval shells and more than a half million cubic feet of refrigerated foodstuffs. We are carrying railroad equipment for the narrow gauge railroad we expect to repair on Saipan. We've brought together 130,000 men and 10 million rounds of small arms. Saipan and the Marianas will fall because the percentages are all ours. But there's another percentage nobody talks much about. In two years of invading islands, we've learned that there will be slightly more than one American casualty for every two Japanese soldiers on the island. This means that 10,000 Americans of this group will be killed, wounded, or missing by the time Saipan is taken. 10,000 casualties at a minimum. That's what it will cost to advance the bomber line 1,000 miles. to battle takes three weeks. During the first days, poker, crap games, speculation, conversation. Later, the ships are quieter. Casual discussions disappear. Slowly, the tension relaxes. The sea is so vast that there seems no end to the voyage. It is so calm that danger seems remote. Day slips into day. Small events that break up the routine become important. Atabrine tablets to guard against malaria.
There is an old army maxim. A good soldier never stands when he can sit, never sits when he can lie down, never stays awake when he can sleep. All hands, now hear this. The destination of this task force is the Marianas. This unit is assigned to the invasion of Saipan. Our primary objective is the Aslito airfield. Resistance is expected to be heavy. Unit commanders will make known all particulars of the order of battle. That is all. continues for two days and nights. After the first hours, the effects of any bombardment must diminish. The enemy is either dead or hidden in fortified positions. Saipan is riddled with caves, and only a direct hit at the mouth of a cave can be effective. The fire is shifted to the shoreline to cover the first waves of American troops. Reserve Force, the 27th Infantry Division. Now it's all behind you. All the big ships, the big guns, the training, the planning, it's all behind you. You're all alone, and in the next 10 minutes, you may be dead. All you have left in the world are the 12 men in your squad. What happens to them happens to you. You're going where they're going. Japanese resistance begins. Not all the enemy's heavy guns have been knocked out. The Japanese begin to recover from the effects of the naval bombardment. Japanese artillery begins to find the range of the American landing craft.
first waves land without too much difficulty. There is some disorganization because some units have landed in beaches not assigned to them. The move inland is delayed. The whole action is behind schedule. The Japanese have regrouped. They begin heavy fire against the beachhead. The American beachhead is 100 yards deep, but it is pinned to the sand and not moving. Some troops begin to dig in. If the assault waves dig in on the beach, they will be slaughtered by the enemy's mortars and artillery. But if the men get up, they will be in an exposed position. The issue is in balance. Everyone waits for the next man to move. Then one man takes command. The rest follow. And the Marines get up and go in. Get up, move over that way! As the Americans reach toward the first airfield, Japanese resistance between the beach and the first airstrip crumples. The battlefield turns quiet. There are two possibilities. Either the enemy has decided not to defend the flat land surrounding Aslito Field, or he is drawing the Americans into an exposed position. The order of the day reads, advance with caution. Secure the airfield, but be prepared to withdraw if the Japanese counterattack. Aslito airfield is taken. Heavy equipment comes ashore immediately. tractors and bulldozers to clear away the wrecked Japanese equipment. Graders and sheep's foot rollers to lengthen the runway. Putting the equipment on shore so soon is a calculated risk. We are concentrating our materiel into a small area. A major counterattack could be disastrous. But a serviceable airstrip will permit American fighter planes to land. The airfield is our first objective, and we must take the risk. The Japanese prepare their counterattack. It is to be a maneuver without military meaning but with great religious overtones to the Japanese themselves. A Banzai charge, a suicide attack which will not end until the last Japanese is dead. waver, but the attack is beaten off. 
Now the infighting begins. The remaining Japanese are holed up in the caves of Saipan. They will not surrender. They must be burned in their caves. will not surrender. They must be blown out of their caves by grenades. They will not surrender. They must be killed by small arms fire. The Japanese lose 32,000 men. The Americans take 16,000 casualties. underestimated the number of Japanese on Saipan by 12,000. We underestimated how bitter the fight would be to extract the Japanese from the caves of Saipan. The Japanese suicide charge split the ranks of one division and led to heavy American casualties. On Saipan, 16,000 casualties. On Tinian, 2,500 casualties. On Guam, 10,000 casualties. Total casualties before the Marianas are secured, 28,000. The Marianas are American. We took our losses so that we could build airstrips. We mourn our dead, hospitalize our wounded, and build airstrips. 28,000 feet of runways are being built. For each foot, one American casualty. no longer any need for combat men. The war is turned over to the machines. The battlefield is becoming an airfield. There's something special about the runways we are building. Their foundations are more than twice as thick as the runways of any bomber base ever built in the Pacific. Their width is half again as great as any strip we have ever built. A B-24 bomber can land in a mile of runway, but the bulldozers scratch out airstrips a mile and a half long. Only a handful of officers know why the extra half mile of runway is necessary. Then, in the skies above the island, a new airplane, the B-29. Inbound to Saipan, Tinian, Guam, the Marianas. Inbound, the super fortress, the highest, biggest, fastest bomber of the war. Inbound to take over the battle. This is an airplane built to fight the war in a new way. Not a tactical bomber, not a weapon to be used against the Japanese army and navy, but a strategic bomber built to destroy Japanese industry and the Japanese home islands. Now that the Marianas have been taken, strategic bombardment of Japan can begin.
This is what the sacrifice of the foot soldier was for. This airplane will carry the burden of the war to Japan. This airplane will end World War II. It was late summer of 1944 when the B-29 bomber arrived in the Pacific theater of war. The war with Japan had less than a year to go. How that particular airplane, combined with the sacrifice of so many U.S. airmen, sailors, and Marines, speeded the end of the war, is the subject of this story. We call it Super Fort. The Air Force hopes that an invasion of Japan will not be necessary, for the strategic weapon is at hand. In theory, this strategic bomber should settle the issue. In theory, we know just where the bomb should be placed. First priority, bomb the Japanese aircraft industry. Halt the manufacture of military planes. Establish air supremacy over Japan. Second priority, bomb Japanese port and urban industrial areas. Submarines will blockade Japan. B-29s will destroy the enemy's tools. This is the theory of strategic bombardment. These are the weapons. The 21st Bomber Command at Saipan is combat ready. Its first target, the Nakajima Aircraft Engine Plant, producing nearly 30% of all combat aircraft engines in Japan. For the first time since the Doolittle Raid two and one half years earlier, American bombers are flying a mission to Tokyo. Twenty four November, nineteen forty four, the first super fort raid against Tokyo. The attitude of the command staff is one of confidence. Some opposition is expected from enemy fighters or flak, but casualties are expected to be light. The B-29 is especially designed for this kind of mission. It is the first very long range, high altitude precision bomber. The planes carry enough bombs to destroy the Nakajima plant on this single mission alone. 111 superforts carrying a bomb load of over half a million pounds. The first wave of the strategic Pacific-based assault against Japan. The theory of continuous strategic bombardment in the Pacific is about to be tested. Five hours out of the Marianas and still several hundred miles from Japan, the B-29s encounter a typically severe weather front and are forced to climb. are unable to go above or around the storm. They must go through it.
Some planes are driven so far off course that they miss Japan completely. Coming into the target, an unexpected obstacle. The B-29s are swept along by the fastest winds in any part of the world, a river of air called the jet stream. The winds increase the speed of the bombers by approximately 40%. The superforts are moving too fast for accurate bombardment. The bombardiers cannot compensate for the wind speed. The target is obscured by clouds. Only 24 of the 111 bombers hit the target. Less than 20 tons of bombs fall into the target area. Most fall wide into the dock and urban areas and into Tokyo Bay. Japanese fighter defense is less effective than anticipated. is lost, rammed by a suicidal Japanese fighter. The Japanese planes drop phosphorus bombs into the American formations. The score is even, less than 1% loss to the attacking B-29s, less than 1% damage to the aircraft engine factory. Homeward flight is 1,500 miles. The bombers have expended their fuel reserves fighting the storm. The trip home is five hours of tension. There is an absolute minimum of fuel. 1,500 miles with no place to land, no place to jump, nothing but the Pacific below. tank, the fuel gauges read empty. All tanks are almost dry when the Marianas come into view. The crippled planes come in first. The right outboard engine is feathered.
During the next three months, this is how they will come home, short of fuel, straining to make the runway. Although bombing results will improve, Japanese resistance will also increase. During the next three months, the number of ditchings increase. There is nothing wrong with the theory of strategic bombardment. There's nothing wrong with the superport. It is a rugged plane that can take battle damage which would down any other bomber. The men fly their missions, take their losses, and return when they can to the bomber bases. The men know the bombers need fighter escort over Japan. The crippled bombers need a refueling and repair point between the Marianas and Japan. With a refueling point, we could carry less gas and more bombs. Something must be done. But the grand strategy of the war does not rest with the pilots. The orders come down the chain of command. The 7th Air Force and all available bombers of the 20th Air Force are ordered to bomb a new target, Iwo Jima. It is 1,500 miles from the Marianas to Japan. Halfway between the Marianas and Japan is a small island, Iwo Jima. For 72 days previous to the invasion, the bombers will strike the island. Then 61,000 Marines will take Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima is only eight square miles of volcanic ash and rock dominated by Mount Suribachi. It has only two assets. It is 700 miles closer to Tokyo. It has three airfields. The Marines are told to expect a three or four day battle. The Navy will deliver a three day barrage preceding the landings. But the Marines are veterans of island warfare. They know the Japanese tactics. The enemy will be underground, hidden in caves. The enemy will be protected by thick-walled concrete fortifications. The Marines know they will take Iwo as they have taken other islands, by individual combat. The last religious service aboard ship before D-Day. February 19th, 
Then the enemy opens fire. Naval and aerial bombardment have caused little damage to the enemy's fortifications. Japanese artillery and mortars are zeroed in on every foot of the island. By noon, it is apparent that this will be the costliest battle in marine history. By noon, Casualties in some battalions are as high as 25%. The surface ships are called on to support the Marines. The vessels move almost to the shore to fire point blank into the Japanese positions only yards from the attacking Marines. Tank attack fails. There is no room for maneuver, for flanking attacks, for deception. There's only one order, move straight ahead. Take the losses and get it over quickly. It cannot be done quickly. The enemy is too well entrenched. Day, the Marines take Mount Suribachi. Twenty-one days later, Iwo Jima is officially declared secure. The eight square miles of Iwo Jima cost 19,000 Marine and Navy wounded, 6,800 Marine and Navy dead. The price is fantastic, but the price had to be paid. Now until the war ends, some 2,400 crippled planes will make emergency landings at Iwo. Twenty-five thousand American flyers who might not have returned to the Marianas will be saved because the Marines took Iwo Jima. The first crippled superforts land even before the concrete surface has been laid. After Iwo is taken, Japan is doomed. Strategic bombardment will end the war. Iwo Jima, 
Tinian, Saipan, Tarawa, Midway, a roll call of battle sites on which was played out the awesome drama of World War II in the Pacific. There were other battlefields, other campaigns, other aspects to this global conflict. We're relating those stories in this continuing series, the CBS Video Library of World War II. I'm Walter Cronkite. Thank <laughs> you.